वेलकम टू एपिसोड नंबर थर्टी सिक्स ऑफ द स्लीपर्स पर अ पॉडकास्ट टूडे आई एम सो एक्साइटेड टू वेलकम जोडी स्टर्न ऑफ को एन उज बुक इसेंशियल ऑयल्स टू बूस्ट द ब्रेन एंड हील द बॉडी इज रिलीजिंग इन अ फ्यू डेज जोडी इज अ बेस्ट सेलिंग ऑथर अवार्ड विनिंग जर्नलिस्ट फंक्शनल प्रैक्टिशनर एंड द फाउंडर ऑफ वाइब्रेंट ब्लू ऑयल्स वे शी इज कम्बाइंड हर ट्रेनिंग इन न्यूट्रिशनल थेरेपी and aromatherapy to create unique proprietary blends of organic and wild crafted essential oils she has helped over 50000 clients heal from brain related challenges including anxiety insomnia and autoimmunity for the past 10 years jodi has lectured at wellness centers conferences and corporations on brain health essential oil stress and detoxification she has been seen in the new york times wellness mama elephant journal and numerous publications her website www.vibrantblueoils.com is visited by over 300000 natural health seekers every year and jodi has rapidly become a top resource for essential oils education on the internet today this is an amazing place to start your aromatherapy journey in today's episode jodi explains what actually happens in your body physiologically in perpetual stress you will discover why jodi is unique in the world of aromatherapy with some profound ways to understand your physiology and unusual takeaways in this jodi clearly explains what is the right way to use aroma oil so that they work specially for you jodi also explains some wonderful links to ancient wisdom she's potent in her knowledge yet gentle in her approach We are a few seconds away from this amazing conversations as listeners you have truly made us humble and amazingly happy when you leave thoughtful and kind words in the apple podcast review section it really helps our podcast grow rise up the ranks on apple podcast charts and i want to really take a moment to appreciate and acknowledge the time that you dedicated to support our work Thank you this really helps us to go on we also love to hear from you and you can reach out to me at deepa@phytothrive.com and share your thoughts questions anything you'd like to share if you want much more after listening to an episode you could reach all these amazing guests by clicking the links in the show notes and you can also subscribe to our newsletter at www.phytothrive.com let's get to the episode and stay tuned for the next episode where we're going to release some amazing news for you stay tuned for that in the meantime enjoy the conversation today welcome to the sleep whisperer podcast i'm your host deepa Join me and my many expert guests and medical professionals from the cutting edge science of functional medicine of the west and ancient wisdom of the east. Learn all about how to discover your root causes of poor sleep and understand the proper tools and techniques to end your confusion and begin getting a good night's sleep. It's time to regain hope and begin your sleep journey. with the sleep whisperer podcast Jodi welcome it's such a pleasure to have you on the sleep whisperer podcast and as we were talking a little bit behind the scenes I've been uh, this is something that has been meant to happen and it's been teasing me a little bit over the last month or two and i'm so glad that it finally happened and we're talking about perpetual stress sleep and of course uh, we will talk a lot about specific aroma therapy since you are such an expert at that and we'll also talk about your book i want to tease the listeners right now but we will come into what the book is about towards the end and 
Um, so we're talking a lot about brain related conditions and what is sympathetic or why do you need to be in parasympathetic mode to get healing of any kind, whatever the condition or symptom. But uh, how did you actually become such an expert in talking about brain related issues, stress itself. So did you have uh, episodes or times of deep stress that taught you this? Because typically that's what becomes our life coach, so to speak. So just share a little bit about yourself with us before we dive deep into the subject. Yeah, I think many people become experts because they are the wounded healer. And I originally delved into nutrition because of my child. My first child was super easy. So I just assumed I was a good mom and had a second one 22 months later. And he was pretty nonstop all the time. And it was um, very exhausting. He would never focus or pay attention. And I tried everything I could think of. And finally I tried nutrition and that really made a huge difference. It really allowed him to self-regulate in a much more profound way. And it was so dramatic that I decided I had to learn more. Like I couldn't believe I had been banging my head against the wall and taking all these parenting classes. And it was as simple as nutrition. So I went back and studied nutrition and was trying to help other moms, you know, with wiggly kids. And because kids are so wiggly, it's hard to assess them. So I learned this technique called muscle testing that allows you to um, assess children and, and people very quickly and really isolate what remedy is going to be the best for the condition. So flash forward a couple years and my then husband um, was bipolar and attempted suicide and we had to move him into a residential treatment facility in a different state because there weren't those facilities in our state. So suddenly I was a single mom, two kids, five and seven, a uh, full-time job and I could barely get out of bed. I had severe adrenal fatigue because I had been so focused on keeping my husband alive that I had neglected myself for a decade. And when he was finally safe and it wasn't my job to keep him alive, my body recognized it was safe to collapse. Mm -hmm. And I knew enough about nutrition and what should help and nothing that historically had helped me was helping. And I'll get to why, I figured that out later, but um, Prior to this happening, I'd helped a, a good friend put on a big event, and she was a big essential oils advocate. So she showed up as a thank you gift slash these will help you gift with a big box of about 40 essential oils. And um, I was so uh, desperate for anything that might help that I muscle tested the box and got a really strong response, which was really encouraging because I, um, you know, for anyone who doesn't feel well and keeps trying things that don't help, you know, you start to get, you, you, you give up hope a little bit. Like you're, yeah. you know, is this, is this my new life? Is this ever going to be better? And what was surprising is that normally when I would test remedies, maybe one would be really clear, but I got five different oils. And at first that was confusing. And then I realized, oh, I can combine them. So I um, was new to oils. I went in the kitchen and literally pulled out a shot glass and muscle tested the amounts, the drops of each, combined them, and I knew that my adrenal glands were really accessible through my low back. So I topically applied them on my low back, and it worked really quickly. I felt like me, you know, I felt like, oh my gosh, I could go running. I could clean the house and make dinner and, you know, do all the laundry and put it away, and kind of this energy that I, I really hadn't felt in a while. So I got an insane amount done that day, you know, and then I put the kids to bed and, and the pattern at that time was I would put them to bed and then I would lay awake, you know, exhausted, but unable to fall asleep. And my mind would be mm -hmm. racing. And I had this thought, gosh, I wonder if there's an oil that could help with the insomnia. So I went back down to my office and made um, a blend that I now call circadian rhythm that triggered the pineal gland to release melatonin. And it was amazing. I mean, for any of your listeners that struggle with sleep, if you finally find something that works, you're just so, it's like tears of joy, you know, like to actually sleep is such a gift. Yeah. And I just kind of kept using those oils and I, I figured out an oil for um, the parasympathetic state. 
and the combination of those three oils in about two weeks, you know, I started to feel like myself again. And so many of my friends were so deeply concerned about me that they, they really wanted to know what helped you. And so I, I shared the blends with them. A lot of them practiced nutrition and were reporting back that this was helping their clients, you know, and I, I should put this out there. And at that point, it occurred to me, somebody must be doing this. Like, it's, you know, so obvious to kind of balance the organ systems and regions of the brain. And I was super surprised by two things. I was surprised that no one was really looking at it through that lens. And the other thing that surprised me was that they made it so complicated. I was slightly grateful that I just didn't have the mental capacity to start with research because yeah. I would have felt completely overwhelmed and unqualified. Mm. Yeah, that's so true because that's what a lot of times it happens in any field where you just feel that you're not equipped to do that for yourself. And one of the things about tools and techniques are that they should be made so simple so that everyone can actually benefit from them. So what actually happened to you physiologically at those times of stress? So how did beyond just staying awake and did you actually feel impact on yourself? Uh, oh in goodness. terms of so anxious. anxiety, harm. Panic attacks, like my big cue would be the supermarket. It's It was bananas. I would go through the supermarket and uh, you know, people just were hard to be around but it would be the checkout line, you know, in the long checkout line, I'd be sitting there and all of a sudden I could feel my heart exploding in my chest and I would start to feel like I was sweating and I would almost feel like I had to get out of there. Like there were many times that I literally just abandoned my cart and, and mm -hmm. left the supermarket. And I actually learned a technique I wanna share. This is what I do now. So I learned, our, our colleague Titus Chu taught me this, that you know, there are two hemispheres of the brain, the right hemisphere yeah. and the left hemisphere, and they mm -hmm. do different things and, and different um, areas of them do different things. And so when you're having an anxiety attack, what he taught me is that it is the right frontal lobe. So kind of right by your forehead, the right side that's overactive. And so the way to balance that and calm that down is to do something to activate the left yes. forehead. And the easiest way to do that is to smell something through your left nostril. Mm. So once I knew that, I just never left home without an oil, you know, and I would feel, you know, because you feel your heart racing and it's like you get really hot and I would just smell something through the left nostril. And it usually took about three to five breaths, but I, I could keep it together. It helped me immensely. Oh, and, and the other point I wanted to make, the reason that the remedies weren't working when I was so adrenally fatigued is because the high levels of cortisol had messed up my gut. And so I wasn't actually assimilating things. So all the supplements that I was taking, you know, ingesting weren't actually getting to where they needed to go because my digestion was so compromised. So topically applying kind of circumvented that whole system and really got the remedies right to where they needed to go. That's amazing, Jodi, and I actually want to stay there for a few moments because this is the first time I've heard about this, that you can actually use a specific nostril. So I want to talk about that a little bit more because no one else has mentioned that ever. And I know that in the world of yoga, there is so much emphasis given to the right, left nostril and how each of us are bring a thing. Yeah, yeah, and there's an entire text called Swara Yoga, which is the science of the breath, where you can use the specific nostril for various activities. For example, when your right is nostril that's active, is that's the time is which is for more active things. And when the left is strong, then that's the time you can do things like reading, focus. So you find that when you're reading a book and then you're very engrossed and suddenly you're reading the same line over and over again, if you actually check, it would have switched to the right nostril. And therefore, even if you try, you can't really... Uh, spend time at that moment reading or being mindful of something where you, which needs mental focus. So just talk a little bit more about how did you discover, nobody's talking about this, the specific use of one nostril. So I want us to just go into that a little bit more. 
Well, yeah, I mean, it, it was really through my son, you know, our children, we, we would do anything for them. Mm -hmm. And he had all these, he, he was very ADD, very low impulse control, all of these things that were disruptive in school. And I really didn't want to medicate him. So I found um, kind of a brain gym facility and they did this interesting assessment and asked all these questions and all these things that I just thought were his quirky little personality, it turned out were correlated to um, over activation of the left hemisphere of the brain. You know, like kids are supposed to go through these stages when they're developing. They're supposed to crawl before they walk, walk before they yeah. run. He pretty much never crawled. He just took off running. And when you crawl, it's kind of this cross body function that integrates the left side with the right side so that they're speaking to each other. You know, think of one as the gas pedal and one as the brake. And if there's not good communication, you get these imbalances. And um, I'm, I'm actually doing this parasympathetic summit November 9th through the 15th. And one of the speakers is an expert on this. His name is Dr. Robert Malulio. And one of the things that he said really struck me. He basically said that every dysfunction that we see from autism to ADD to even like Alzheimer and Parkinson is all overactivation of the left side of the brain. That the right isn't functioning and isn't in balance. And my chiropractor backed that up. He said that a lot of people have a slight tilt to the right. Their head kind of tilts to the right because what the body is trying to do, the body's always trying to return to balance. And right. so if, if you're out of balance, it naturally kind of pushes yourself back into balance. And what's cool about oils is, you know, your nose goes directly into your brain. Like nose cells are yes. brain cells. So it's the easiest way, like this whole area of functional neurology where that's actually what they're doing. They're identifying where is the imbalance between the two hemispheres. And so they either topically apply oils on specific regions of the brain to activate it or to have you smell. So it's really just trying to stimulate the weaker part of the brain so that it goes back into balance. Mm. So do you actually close off the right nostril when you breathe in through the left? Like You can, I mean, I, I, yeah, I do yoga, so that's what I do. But um, I've had other clients who just tell me just putting the bottle close to the left nostril works. So it's it's personal preference. Mm. Interesting. So I I think um, I mean, is there a way that somebody can actually understand somebody who's not in neurology or someone who doesn't have access to a new functional neurologist? Is there a way that they can just know that one side is more active yeah. and they need yeah. to Dr. Robert Malilio, he's written, um, I think, three books, The Disconnected Child, and I, I'm pretty sure you can get them all over the world or on his website. Okay. He okay. has really good quizzes. And then there's this woman, Tara Hunkin, who has a site, My Child Will Thrive, and she's also a warrior mom, same story, you know, a kid that just was challenging. And she's mm. done an even better job of really distilling that information down. So yeah, there are a lot of resources out there. You just don't know, right? You think like, exactly. oh, it's just their personality. And then yeah. you start to notice, oh my goodness, who knew? I think it's also this delicate balance between not being a paranoid mother, but also listening to your inner voice. And that's a very delicate balance because sometimes you could also lose time because you believe in your child so much that you don't want to listen to those cues like what you spoke about. And then there's the other way around that you're getting upset for every little thing and thinking that there's something wrong for everything. So it is a bit of a delicate balancing act over I think, there. For I think a mother. there's a middle road where you can just, because yes. a lot of times, I mean, it's not just our kids, it's, it's us too. You can just educate yourself and say, oh, that's really fascinating. Like in my book, I actually map out what's the right hemisphere do and what does the left hemisphere do? Mm -hmm. You know, you can even, it, I'm sure it's a really easy Google search. Just being aware, you know, like one thing with Max, he used to, um, spill food like he he couldn't walk a straight line like he'd always kind of walk into you or he'd mm -hmm. always spill food he had no spatial awareness zero spatial awareness and that's all right hemisphere so there's certain um personality traits that kind of fall into which set which hemisphere is more active right um, okay, so talk to me a little bit about the vagus nerve because I'm, again, that's an area that I speak a lot about, but 
what does the vagus nerve actually do and how does it come into these kind of um, brain related issues anxiety stress what is the role that the vagus nerve plays and what can somebody actually do to help themselves yeah so the vagus nerve is really kind of the gear shift between two states of your nervous system so in case people don't know your autonomic nervous system controls your automatic functions your breathing, your heart rate, your digestion, your immune response, your ability to anti-inflame, all the things that you don't have to consciously, you know, like you have to think, raise your arm, you don't have to think heartbeat. And it has kind of two speeds. So it, it's designed to keep you alive. So if there's any kind of threat to your existence, you know, they often use the tiger chasing you. It could be that you're driving and someone's about to change into your lane and doesn't see you. Or it could even be, um, you know, worry and, and you know stressful thoughts like a, a relationship isn't going well or maybe you're worried that you might lose your job or you're worried about a child or you know the current state of the world basically any kind of stress response whether it be perceived stress or physical stress triggers this whole chemical castigate where you release these kind of stimulatory hormones like adrenaline um, and so that kind of turned on stress state is known as the sympathetic branch of the nervous system. And what mm -hmm. happens is it, it really shifts into a survival space. So everything that can keep you alive turns on, your heart beats faster. So more blood and oxygen can flow to your arms and limbs so that you can either, you know, if it's a predator, fight back or flee, run away. But what it does is it prioritizes that survival response over kind of the um, average healing function. So, for example, the blood's routed to your arms and legs away from your organs of digestion. So it's not really helping you digest your food. Away from your organs of detoxification. You know, with inflammation, it's, it's interesting because in the short term, it kind of turns off inflammation because if you're running and you twist your ankle, you could die. So it doesn't really trigger it. But when that goes on for a long period of time, it actually allows chronic inflammation to occur under the scenes where you might not be aware of it. It turns off your immune function. What's designed to happen is there's some kind of danger or stress. You know, think about in the wild, the tiger is chasing the lion or the zebra, you know, or the gazelle. It runs really fast, it escapes the danger, it kind of shakes to release those stress hormones, and then it switches back into the, you know, rest, heal, digest. You can think of the, um, sympathetic state is kind of the gas pedal and the parasympathetic state as the brake. All of a sudden your body, you're good, you're not dead, you can route your blood flow back to digestion, you can calm down, you can sleep, you know, you don't have those alert energy I hormones rushing through your system. Um, and the vagus nerve is the on off switch between those two states. And what's cool is there are a lot of ways to kind of activate it. You, know, you might think of it as, as flipping a light switch or um, shifting gears on a bike. You can help it to kind of say, okay, I'm not in danger, I can calm down. And you can do that through breath work because the vagus nerve starts at the back of the head, the base of the brain. It kind of splits and winds around on both sides behind the earlobe. If you feel behind your earlobe, you can feel that bone. That is your mastoid bone. That is where it is most accessible to the surface. And there's actually a surgically implanted device that they put in there, like a pacemaker, that can stimulate the vagus nerve to activate the parasympathetic state. It also winds through your, your throat, your face, like smiling, you know, your heart, your lungs, every organ of digestion. So any point that it innervates, you can use to activate it. So you can do breathing exercises to activate it. It goes through your gallbladder. You can do coffee enemas that stimulate the gallbladder. It goes through your face. You can splash your face with freezing water, which then causes you know, the blood to flow and turn on the vagus nerve. But a lot of these things, I, I knew this from yoga early on, and I was always saying to people, you're stuck in the gear of stress. Like we need to shift you out. And they really, their compliance was terrible. You know, things like gagging yourself with a tongue depressor, like nothing that anyone wanted to do. Yeah. And so when I, when I figured out like, oh, they're using electric devices to stimulate right here, oils can be very stimulatory. You know, some of them feel hot or they make your skin red, they're stimulatory. 
And clove in particular is a really good one because it was used in dentistry to numb pain. It's really good for like cleaning up toxicity. So I, um, I think that oils in combination are better than in isolation. You know, like if you go to a menu, they don't just give you an apple. <laughs> they usually like buy different things. So anyway, I, I realized that by applying this combination of clove and lime behind the earlobe on that bone, even like if you're at home right now, just kind of rubbing it, that's mm. a really good way to activate that nerve. And that almost shifts you into this calmer space. It's like suddenly, you know, a, a good cue, um, your pupils, the black part of your eyes, when you're in the sympathetic space, they get really big. So they can take in more light and it almost shuts down kind of your creative problem solving skills, you know, because if you're in that life or death situation, you know, uh, contemplating your navel could, you know, prevent you from surviving. So you can really only focus on like your next move. So all of a sudden the world seems very black and white. When you can calm down, your pupil, the black part really shrinks down and all of a sudden you can access like your corpus callosum and all of your problem solving skills. You feel safe. You can realize like, oh my God, this isn't black and white. I have all these options or maybe I need more information. And it's just a much um, more balanced place from which to make decisions. That's super interesting because that's another thing actually I never knew about and I'm going to use this so much now that I actually did this uh, pupil check is a great way to actually get the physiological assessment of that. And by um, activate the vagus nerve, you mean that it uh, supports modulating these function, the balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So exactly. when you they are, when you say that the parasympathetic nervous system supports all healing, what do you actually mean by that? So is, that's because um, you're saying that the functions come back to the digestion, immune function. Is that why it helps overall healing? Well, it's different um, chemicals that you signal, you know, like when you're in emergency versus when you're calm, you know, like think about during the day, uh, when you wake up in the morning, you do more energizing activities than when you're kind of trying to calm down before bed. But the big um, neurotransmitter that's released by the vagus nerve in the parasympathetic state is acetylcholine, which does a lot of great things. It helps your heart rate calm down. And your heart rate really, you know, there are a lot of rhythms in your body that kind of work in tandem. Like think of it of, of these gears, but when your heart rate slows down, all of a sudden you're able to um, you know, connect with other people in a, in a better way. Like, you know, when pupils are really big, if you're trying to have a really important conversation with someone in your life and their pupils are like big black saucers, they really can't hear you and take in that information. So basically it just, you know, it, it lays the foundation. It's, it's the whole hormonal, you know, neurotransmitter cascade for, okay, blood is flowing to digestion and detoxification, giving it the energy and the vitality to help, you know, detoxify the body, allowing the white blood cells to circulate and, and help remove pathogens. It's really, um, you know, like uh, I used to work at this, this big store in Seattle and there were certain crazy times of the day and you were just nonstop and you didn't really have a chance to clean up because you were so busy being proactive. And then when there was a lull, it was like, okay, you know, I can take the shoe boxes back off the store. I can maybe sweep up. Think of it that way. Like when your body is actively, you know, fighting danger, it really can't clean up. You need that kind of lull to catch up and, and do all of the maintenance and repair. Yeah, that's definitely required. And I think I talk a lot about how impaired detoxification is the reason for most major disease today. And uh, in, I mean, wherever, whether it's lymphatic system, whether it's uh, liver. Um, so, and of course, as you said, vagus nerve, and I have to mention also how it is, it plays such a key role in elimination, transit time. Uh, so why somebody ends up with chronic constipation. So Yes, uh, definitely. Motility wave. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So 
you jodi you talk about these five essential steps to gain control of your health talk me through all of those and how essential oils actually support all those areas yeah and you know it's interesting like kind of where we start in the beginning of our careers and what we learn along the way like early on i thought oh everyone's bio individual they're all different and then you start to notice these symptom clusters and you start to notice that certain things were important for everyone like sleep it's impossible to heal if you're not sleeping right I and oils oils are a great way to trigger sleep it's really hard to heal it, it's kind of like if if you're biking i i bike and i live in seattle which is crazy hills you know if i'm going into a hill in high gear i have to work a lot harder than if i just downshift and go into low gear so if you're making sure that your body is in the right gear to um you know digest your food like digestion actually begins in the brain you know you're, you smell the food that signals the vagus nerve your mouth releases saliva to help break down start the digestion process your stomach releases hydrochloric acid your pancreas releases enzymes, gallbladder releases bile, then it goes into the gut and there's the whole motility wave where it moves through and you get eliminated. If any of those processes aren't really going, then, you know, things don't move through at the right time and you have constipation or things ferment in your gut and you have um, IBS or SIBO or all these other things. So to your point, being, being in the parasympathetic state is really critical to healing because that allows all healing functions to turn on. So those are the top two. Drainage, which you mentioned, which I actually think is where oils play the biggest role. You know, the lymphatic system, most people don't realize that toxins have to leave the cell. They go to the lymph where they're carried to the blood, to the liver, to the gallbladder, to the gut, to the toilet. But at any point in that system, they, it can get, you know, if the lymph isn't flowing, get, get stuck there. If the bile isn't flowing or the liver is congested, it gets stuck there. So anything you can do to really help move things through the system, and that's where oils are fantastic. You know, oils play a powerful role in plants. They help to move, they support immunity. You know, they, they carry fluids through the system. Like, you know, some really tall trees, they've got the roots deep in the ground and the leaves like hundreds of feet in the air. And it's oils that help things move through the system. The lymphatic system doesn't have its own pump. So it relies on us moving our body, you know, and oils can help um, actually, you know, make the vasculature expand and, and carry fluids through you so that you um, eliminate things and drain out. So is there something specific that you've created as a blend for uh, optimal detoxification? What, what does that include? Yeah, so... Well, the lymph blend includes, and, and keep in mind, you know, people um, like helichrysum is one of them and everyone kind of knows like helichrysum is great. It's crazy expensive, but bizarrely, when you combine things, they do different functions. So this one is palmarosa, ylang, ylang, spearmint, helichrysum, and vitex berry. And it's a combination of moving and grounding. You know, one of the nice things about oils, especially um, those from like root plants, you know, like vetiver or um, any of the trees, cedar wood that have deep roots, it really helps you kind of ground to the earth. It, it puts energy into the ground. And so by, by moving, you know, flowing, helping to carry things down. And, and one of the big bottlenecks, sadly, is the neck, which is kind of what causes problems in the brain. You know, if you have congestion in the neck, then the toxins really don't have the space to drain yeah. down. You know, yeah. and in the neck, there is um, the nerves, the skeletal system, the muscles, the lymph, the vasculature, and they all are kind of fighting for space, almost like if you're on an airplane, you're fighting for the armrest with the person next to you. So what yeah. we found happens is that sometimes if the vagus nerve is infected, it kind of, um, you know, compresses the lymph or vice versa. If the lymph is really congested, it compresses the vagus nerve. So anything you can do to open up that neck channel is fantastic. And the um, accessibility of, you know, topically applied essential oils, which kind of get in, you know, they're, they're fat soluble so they can get through the skin and really get into the bloodstream and really help to dilate and expand that space so that more things can drain is really fabulous. So is that also connected to the brain's glymphatic system? Yes, yes. 
So usually when somebody is prone to congested sinus in the morning and typically yep. they put it down as allergies, but it's not really that. It's just usually congestion. So what do essential oils do in terms of glymphatic system and uh, brain related conditions? So supporting anxiety and depression. Yeah. So I'll talk about the glymphatic system first, because I do an entire chapter on that. And it's mm -hmm. two things. It's kind of the, the chemical. So the hormone melatonin, which starts part of the process, and then actually um, the manual lymphatic system that opens up. So we have a blend that helps uh, the pineal gland kind of trigger the release of melatonin, and then a blend that helps with the, the lymphatic flow. And you were pointing out the sinuses. The sinuses actually drain down the neck as well. Um, blue tansy is a great mm. oil. You can smell it. You can apply it behind the ears, back of the neck, put a little Q-tip on it and kind of swirl it in the nostrils. That helps with sinus stuff. Sinus stuff is often related to mold. You know, it can be really low-key mold that you don't even know about. So look and make sure you remediate or um, things like binders. There are certain binders that help pull the mycotoxins and mold out of your system. But yeah, you're 100% you're right. It's really important when you're sleeping, your brain actually shrinks a bit and it's a little bit like a car wash. It's the um, glial cells in the brain combined with the lymphatic system. So glial dependent lymphatic or glymphatic system that washes through and then drains down the neck. And if the neck is congested from sinus drainage or other things, then those toxins don't drain and they stay in the brain and they can contribute to inflammation. You know, it's a toxin, the immune system recognizes it as uh, not us. And so it then triggers this whole inflammatory cascade that can contribute to depression and anxiety. Um, inflammation in the frontal lobe is often correlated with depression. So anything that you can do, you know, if you think about it, when you have a headache or your kid has a headache, you tend to put your hand on your forehead. And what you're doing is you're drawing energy there. And when you draw energy, you draw blood flow. And that helps to kind of reboot it and, and calm, you know, the pain, calm depression. So anything you can do to kind of put oil on your forehead and draw energy there helps to calm depression. And, and it's interesting. This is something I do talk about in the book. But there's a correlation between um, the, the part of your brain that's really active with anxiety is the amygdala. It's the danger response. It perceives danger before you even consciously perceive danger. So say you're about to cross the street and you suddenly jerk back and then you realize a bus almost hit you. That was your amygdala just taking action. But sometimes it overreacts. Like you might be walking in the woods and you think you see a snake. And then your amygdala checks in with your executive function, you know, frontal cortex, and you realize, oh, that's just a stick. So you're designed to kind of right. toggle between these two areas of the brain. You know, if the frontal lobe, you know, you're, you're depressed and your frontal lobe isn't really working, then you feel more anxious. So it's great anything you can do to kind of draw energy to your frontal lobe. That could be smelling something as simple as peppermint or rosemary. It could be mm. topically applying them. They're hot, so dilute them with another oil so that they don't make your forehead red or you know, feel hot to the touch. That does two things. It kind of pulls the energy out of the amygdala, the anxiety center, and it activates the frontal lobe. So it alleviates depression and anxiety. Very interesting, Jody, because that also gives mothers a tool because, I mean, if, some, if a child has uh, attention issues or is very restless and doesn't really uh, sit down and smell something, that's a great option because then you're taking it away from a conscious, um, I mean, if a child cannot consciously do those things, then that's a great option as well. And you're so right about this whole, I think there's always this little um, uh, argument going on between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex but so many people do have overactive amygdala and um, today because it's such a fight of light sympathetic dominant time that we are in and the, the, these are all wonderful tools but I want to give us a little bit of time to talk about your book 
So uh, what is the book uh, really about? Because how is it different in terms of when you speak about aromatherapy? I know from our conversation today that there's a lot of unique information that you share. So I'm sure the book is, uh, I mean, a Bible of sorts. And I'm definitely going to get myself a copy as soon as it's out. But tell us about your book. Yeah, it's essential oils to boost the brain and heal the body. And basically, you know, um, in clinical practice, you start to see the same cluster of symptoms and you start to recognize that certain things always seem to work. And then you're like, I wonder why, like, I, I, you know, what did I do right? So you start to reverse engineer and you find all this research that backs it up and you're like, oh my God, that makes so much sense. And then you Mm. wonder why is not everyone talking about this? Like, you know, one of the tragedies of our time is that so many people have brain related ailments in part, you're right from having toxicity that doesn't leave the brain. So it then triggers inflammation that presents as symptoms. And, you know, we just kind of say, oh, you can't get remedies in the brain because the blood brain barrier only only allows super small fat soluble molecules in. Well, guess what? Essential oils are super small mm. fat soluble molecules. I think that's why essential fatty acids work so well. Omega threes, they yeah. are the right key to unlock that door. And so they can actually communicate with the brain. And part of me was like, this seems so obvious. Why is no one talking about this? So I really just wanted to give people an affordable tool and empower them with strategies so that they don't need to feel victim. You know, like, oh, I'm just old, that just happens. Oh, my mother had this. No, you get to control your future and your health. And there are a lot of easy things that you can do. Yeah, so do you actually walk people through how uh, um, to recognize which area of the brain that they have challenges with and how to actually support each of that with the right oil, the right usage? Oh, that's excellent. So I definitely want to Yeah, it's two parts. The first part really details all of the things that we're talking about and, uh, you know, also including like oxygen to the brain, which is so important, blood sugar balance in the brain focus. And then I go into this prescriptive part in the separate second section and really talk about these are the exact oils. Because I feel like I've noticed even for myself that if, you know, you just go to a doctor and they give you like supplements and you don't really know what they do, you know, it's pretty easy to not take them. If you're really clear, like this is going to help do X, Y, and Z, you're much more likely to take them because you know why they're benefiting you. So I really want people to understand what's going on so that they can be an active participant in healing it. Oh, absolutely. I believe strongly that unless someone understands the why, they're not likely to do the X for sure. Um, So Jodi, I have personally got so many unique takeaways from our conversation, especially about the pupil check, using the left nostril alone to activate a parasympathetic response. Uh, So I can't wait to get my hands on your book. But before we conclude, sorry, my dog is sudden. I have a dog. My my (laughs) was having a party upstairs. We're, We're good. I have five of them. Okay, so before we before I let you go, Jody, two quick questions. There's so many people with uh, diagnosed sleep disorders, and of course, I think you and I both would probably agree that it's because of such a sympathetic dominant time and um, so many things leading to sympathetic dominance today. But in your mind, what do you think is the biggest root cause of sleep issues today? I think it's um, anticipatory stress and worry. And I think that anything that you can do during the day and even in your mind to calm that, like the easiest way to get out of stress is to go into gratitude. Because if you're in gratitude, you're really thinking positive thoughts. It's very hard. You know, the brain can't multitask very well. So it can't really worry about things and be grateful at the same time. So just making a list and, you know, my dad used to say, uh, you need someone to love something to do and something to look forward to. So when I, when I'm struggling with gratitude, that's kind of where I start. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's so true. When you're actually having thinking about I'm grateful for you really can't worry. That's such a simple thing. But I think people don't really think about it in that way. So that's a great. You don't even need to get out of bed. 
to think about you don't need things. to get out of bed you don't need uh, to spend money on it you yeah. don't require an expert to be there for it you simply have to just tell yourself that um, and even if we just tell our kids, just say it's at night before you fall asleep, I'm grateful for what he, I mean, I know when I did this with my son, Jody, a while ago, he would say such simple things like, I'm grateful that I got a chocolate today. And it's so simple and beautiful. Um, and whatever makes sense to each person, it really, there's no right or wrong way to do something like that. So, uh, we have a little mantra on the Sleep is for a podcast, which is if sleep is the new medicine, then, and then we ask people to complete that sentence. So how would you complete it? If sleep is the new medicine, the world is going to heal a lot faster. Tell about tools to activate the vagus nerve, you know, in case you missed anything or wanted to go back and revisit it. So I think um, that's one of the first books that I'm going to get myself. And thank you for being here, Jodi. I might have you back at some point to go a little deeper into parasympathetic and left brain and left nostril because this was such a beautiful conversation. It was great having you here today. Thank you so much. It was great to be here. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed the show. Just a reminder that this podcast is for information purposes only. This is not a substitute for professional care by a doctor or otherwise qualified health professional. This information is provided on the understanding that it does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. If you are looking for personal help, on your health journey, do seek out a medical practitioner. Please do make your own healthcare decisions based upon your research and in partnership with your doctor or otherwise qualified healthcare professional. It is in no way intended as medical advice as a substitute for medical counseling or as treatment or cure for any particular health condition. Be sure to always work directly with a qualified health practitioner before making any changes to your diet or lifestyle that may feel out of your realm of comfort or understanding. If you are looking for an allied functional medicine practitioner, do seek out more information on www.phytothrive.com or www.sleepwhisperer.pro. It is important that you have someone who is qualified and understands your health personally in order to provide adequate care, especially when it comes to chronic health conditions. 